Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast brought to you by Letterman Row and Buyers Automotive. If you're looking for an auto, head to buyersauto.com, find the best selection of new and used vehicles in central Ohio. If you're looking for Ohio State Recruiting Stuff, stay right here. Tonight, myself and Andrew Ellis are going to be talking about Ohio State football recruiting, what's happening in the world of Buckeyes, uh, you know, efforts. And uh, maybe we'll talk to Sam Spiegelman from On3.com as well, get him in for a minute to Talk about the latest in the Tackett Curtis uh, recruitment, and of course, the anyone else who has recruiting in the Louisiana East Texas uh, world. So let's get to it. Andrew, it's time for stuff. Let's talk stuff. It's been a while since we've talked stuff, so let's talk stuff first about the most important stuff that's stuffed recently, which is, of course, the commitment of Dylan Rayola uh, last week. It, the the Afterglow has sort of calmed down. Everyone's back to normal. The Buckeyes are pushing ahead. And the question that people keep asking me, of course, is what happens in 23? Because now you have Dylan Rayola as the quarterback in 2024. Ohio State still wants one in 2023. What do they do? I mean, I think we're not going to know the answer to that until we see a couple more offers go out maybe here in the next couple months during camp season. Um, I think anybody who's got their site set on Dante Moore or a guy of that caliber um, probably wants to move down the list a little bit. I don't think Ohio State's really involved there. Um, and I really don't think we're going to have an answer until uh, Ryan Day and Corey Dennis get to see a couple more guys throw here in the coming months. Yeah, it's starting. I mean, it starts two weeks from now, period. I mean, June 1st is camp season starts for Ohio State. And on that day, uh, Baylor commitment, Austin Novasad, Novasad, Novasad. I don't know exactly how to pronounce the last name. I'll figure that out. Novo Sad, he's from Texas. He's coming to Ohio State to, to work out for Ohio State and throw for, for Ryan Day and Corey Dennis. So if you're looking for like a new name to look into, I got a tip on that one from our Inside Texas guys with on3.com that the Buckeyes have been sniffing around with Austin. And at that point, now it's, you know, whoever wants it is going to get it at, at this point. Ohio State's going to probably see a different quarterback or two every camp and then make an offer. And then if that guy wants it, that's your opportunity. And so I wrote about it last week, and it's actually kind of nuts to me to think about if you go back to Dwayne Haskins as a red, redshirt sophomore, heads off to the NFL. Justin Fields, redshirt sophomore, heads off to the NFL. C.J. Stroud will be a redshirt sophomore this year when he heads off to the NFL. Next year, Kyle McCord will be a redshirt sophomore and could head off to the NFL. The year after that, Devin Brown could be a redshirt sophomore and head off to the NFL. And then the class of 2023 quarterback, believe it or not, as crazy as it sounds for everyone looking at the roster and saying, oh, this is such a loaded position. In one year of playing quarterback at Ohio State as a redshirt sophomore, it could be off to the NFL. So like, it's not like a position where there's no path to playing time or there's no opportunity to get developed and still make it to the NFL. It's right there in front of this guy. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of weird when you look at it, look at it that way, but it's just – what guy is going to want to kind of be sandwiched in between the McCord, the Devin Brown, and now Dylan Rayola? I think that's that's going to be the tricky part. And we know the the transfer portals out there too is an option. I don't know if Ohio State has any intention of going that route rather than finding a um, a prep quarterback. Um, but but there is definitely is a path to playing time. And when you kind of it's kind of weird to say that just knowing how yeah. the quarterback recruiting has gone lately. I think the interesting thing is that the transfer portal becomes a much more realistic and probably much more important avenue if Devin Brown somehow beats out Kyle McCord next year because then you potentially are looking at going into next spring or end of next spring with just Devin Brown and whoever the 2023 quarterback ends up being. And at that point, you now need a veteran in that room. I think the best case scenario for Ohio State is that the it plans out exactly like I just said, McCord for a year, Brown for a year, 2023 guy for a year, and then Dylan Rayola for, for two years. And that's what you're hoping for, but it's not necessarily guaranteed to go that way. And, um, you know, the Buckeyes want a quarterback. They need a quarterback. In my mind, they probably need two quarterbacks, but that, I, that seems like a, a stretch. Uh, but – it is sort of the most important question, I think, for people as to how that plays out. But it doesn't need to be the most important question at this point, or you just at some point just chalk it up and go, hey, you know what? Ryan Day seems to know what he's doing. I mean, I think we just with with Rayola now committed, we're just kind of I think a lot of people are just kind of not not caring about 2023 maybe so much. But and I said this last week or the other week when we talked on on here, um, I think over the next couple months, just who's going to emerge as that target, whether it's the Baylor kid or somebody else. Um, that's going to be one of the bigger 
kind of under the radar storylines here over the next coming weeks and coming months. Yeah, because it's super important. I mean, it, it's not as it's not as though it, it's not a wide receiver position where you're talking about adding a fourth wide receiver in a class or something like that. You're talking about a guy that is going to be could be very potentially the backup quarterback next year for Ohio State. I mean, that it's that sort of urgency. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to run into another one of those Justin Field, first year Justin Field situations back in uh, 2019 when there was just nobody behind him. Because right. that, I mean, that can be disastrous. And I know they're going to try to avoid that at all costs. Yeah. And that's why you, you just have to go out there. And we've talked about it before, but recruit the best player every year, every time, and let the chips fall away where they may. And Ohio State's not going to give up the chase for Dante Moore. They're not going to give up the chase for Dylan Lonergan. They're not going to give up the chase for these guys that they've been recruiting. But at the same time, you got to be realistic and understand that these kids are looking at at bigger pictures because even though there is a path to playing time, it's still a path to playing time in three years. So you got to find someone that wants to develop in that freshman year and then wants to play part time in his redshirt freshman year and then is ready to emerge as a sophomore, redshirt sophomore. So that's quarterback. Dylan Rayola is good. I went and saw him in Arizona, folks. He's good. Uh, he throws the ball very, very well. It's it's kind of ridiculous how easy he makes it look for a kid that just turned 17. Um, you know, he's a, he's a special, special player. You can see why everyone is goo goo gaga about him. I mean, the size, the ability to throw the ball uh, in space, to throw it with zip, to throw it uh, off platform, to throw it however he wants is really something incredible. And I mentioned before, I don't know if it was on this show or, or on a radio show or something, but kind of reminds me a little bit of what we saw to Quinn Ewers and the ability to make things happen just sort of from weird angles. But when Rayola is just dropping back in the pocket, he's much more, uh, maybe not much more, but he's more technically clean than Ewers was at, in high school uh, at that point. And, and so I think that that's where people, you can really can get excited about what Dylan Rayola can bring to the table. Yeah. I mean, I just, from watching him, he's just so like big and built, you know, he's, I think he's probably close to about the same height as CJ Stroud, maybe, but he's just so much, I mean, bulkier, bigger. He's just well-developed for a, uh, for a 2024 kid, I think. Yeah. I joked with his dad. I'm like, I think that Dylan is actually the same size as Dominic was when he was recruited as an offensive lineman to Nebraska, you know, 28 years ago. So it's, it's funny how uh, that plays out, but the most important thing for Dylan Raiola is how he now serves as the de facto leader slash quarterback in the class of 2023 and the class of 2024. I mean, we saw immediately last week him on the phone with players or receivers in the class of 23. He was talking to Bryson Rogers on the phone. He's talked to Noah Rogers. He's talked to Carnell Tate. He's talked to, I mean, he he's not a guy that is going to be rah, rah front and center on social media, but behind the scenes, he's been active already. And that's what you really want out of your quarterback, especially when he's the number one ranked player in the country, because that's like, you know, added, added value. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen some of the big name 2024 receivers, uh, the Jeremiah Smiths and those types that Ohio State's very much in play for, if not leading for. And now you have Brian Hartline, Ryan Day, and Dylan Rayola all there to kind of recruit those guys. I mean, it, it doesn't get much bigger than that. Nope. And, you know, what we're really looking at here over the next few weeks is just the class of 2023 should – start to almost round into shape. And the class of 2024, we're going to see who the real priorities are uh, in that class. And in the 23 class, I think the important thing is that Ohio State cements its, you know, list, I guess, uh, at linebacker, at safety, in the corner, because that really, other than offensive tackle, seems like the defense is wide open at this point, and the offense is not. Yeah, I mean, defensive line, there's a long way to go there. Uh Cornerback, like you said, they've got they've got one guy committed in Dijon Johnson, and we've seen some twists and turns there with the whole AJ Harris saga, which is pretty much uh, pretty much behind us now. But um, I mean, we we know what's going on with wide receiver. I think there's only a couple guys out there now that are the top top of the board guys. But defensive line, offensive line, we've talked about the offensive tackle concerns. Um, but June's going to be a uh, it's going to be a wild month, especially that last weekend in June, which is setting up to be the big one. Yeah, the Buckeyes have to get offensive on the defensive side of the recruiting. And that's why we're going to talk to Sam Spiegelman, uh, one of the on3.com regional analysts. He's from the southeast slash Louisiana slash East Texas. And uh, he's one of the guys in that area. He's, he, he's familiar, pretty, pretty familiar with Tackett Curtis, among other players down in that region. So we're going to have Sam join us on the show to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But what I also want to 
really focus on for Ohio State is this battle that's developing at safety because I think it's the important one. I mean, Jim Knowles has talked about how important the safety is going to be in his defense, and the Buckeyes want four. Clearly, they want four safeties in this class because they've got Malik Hartford, they've got Cedric Hawkins. And there's no slowdown at all when it comes to recruiting Caleb Downs, Jaden Bonsu, Damon Fagan. Yeah, and we we talked about Caleb Downs last week and how that would be maybe the biggest recruiting win of the Ryan Day era. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but is Ohio State on track to get the last visit for him? Is he one of the late June? He, he's one of the 24th visitors, yes. So, I mean, he, he's certainly – I don't know if it's the final visit for him. It's the. I think it's got to be the last visit in June So, uh, because the dead period or quiet period starts like the 28th or something. So. Yeah, but it's just strange we're talking so much about safety with two guys already committed. But, I mean, like you said, with Jim Knowles' scheme and how much effort they're putting into those guys, I mean, it's clearly still being viewed as a major – a major need moving forward on the defense. So but right about it, it, it's interesting. Caleb Downs is good enough that if he was at Ohio, if he was practicing for with Ohio State right now, he'd be playing this year. Uh, and I've talked to people who cover Georgia and say that he'd be starting by week three down in Georgia this year. Uh, Alabama certainly is telling him the same things. And so when you start to look at a player of that magnitude in this class and I'm just going to say it right now. If if Perry Eliano finds a way to land a commitment from Caleb Downs, I hope that Perry Eliano's contract gets an extension and a raise by June, by July 1st, because the guy's going to earn it. Uh, you know, and then again, they're still going after Jaden Bonsu from New Jersey quite a bit. Eliano was there to see him this week, and there's been a lot of talk in the message board world and scuttlebutt because if you look at Jaden Bonsu and his size. You think that this is a kid who could play, potentially grow into a linebacker spot. That's not in the cards at all right now. But, I mean, bodies change, I guess, when you get to 22, 23 years old. Yeah, I mean, that's – I know there's been a lot of talk about him playing linebacker. I think there's some pictures of him out there where he just looks like a – kind of like a chiseled Greek god, so to speak. But from what I understand and from what you said, it sounds like they're looking at him as a safety as well. And um, I don't know. It's going to be a wild month there at uh, – at safety, and if Perry if Perry Eliano can land Caleb Downs, that's going to be, um, that's going to be one of the biggest recruiting wins in recent memory. Quite honestly, I mean, probably in ten years. Uh, honestly, if we're being, if you don't want to put too much of a, it's that's crazy to say. Maybe because the Buckeyes have you know landed five five star quarterbacks in the last sixteen minutes or something like that, but like it, I, we've talked about the significance of that recruitment and how it could mirror Von Bell's impact at Ohio State and what he did for Urban Meyer. And Ryan Day, because the class of 2021 was so good, I think people um, are, are looking at 23 and say, oh, how, you know, how does he top it? There were, there were seven five-stars in the class of 2021. And Ohio State's in a position in 2023 where I did my class predictions over the last week. I think they could be in the mix really for five or six in this class. And when you're talking about replacing an almost an entire defensive staff and still going out and finding that many big time players, it just speaks to the the way Ohio State's program is right now. But also, the Buckeyes aren't doing it with the NIL smoke and mirrors like everyone else, and so it feels like it's a little bit slower burn. But we'll talk, you know, more about that as we go. Let's take a, a brief break. Get Sam Spiegelman from on 3 sportscom in the mix, and uh, and we'll be back in just a moment. Sam Spiegelman joining myself and Andrew Ellis on Talking Stuff. Sam, welcome to Talking Stuff. You were on an episode of one of my podcasts like three years ago when we were doing this in a whole different manner and style. That time, the video didn't work, and I just heard your your dulcet uh, tones the entire time. It was wonderful. Uh, how are you? Uh, yeah, I remember I remember that uh, talking to Miche, and I think I was in a hotel somewhere in, in Dallas or Houston, and I was just roaming talking to you for about two or three hours. So. Um, I'm doing very Adelaide. Boy, oh boy, Chimiche Adelaide. That's a name we haven't said in a while. Wow. Uh, and, and probably probably for good reason. Let's talk Tackett Curtis first, man, because he's the guy. You're in Louisiana. Um, Tackett Curtis over there in Manny, Louisiana. Is it pronounced Manny or is it some weird Cajun accent that I don't know? It's just Manny. Manny. Not so Manny, not Manny. It's it's Manny, and if you are from Manny, you're Manny made. And that's their oh. slogan. Manny made. Okay. Well, Tackett Curtis is Manny made. Uh, he certainly he, is. His He's basically is the Ra- face of that slogan. If you think his about nick- it, his nickname is Rambo. 
Uh, and actually, you know, they've got a couple other players at Manny High School that are, are interesting mm-hmm. players to watch. We'll talk about them as, as things unfold this summer. But there are other guys at Manny as well. Tackett Curtis, give us a little bit of an insight, Sam, into why he's the fourth-ranked linebacker in the country and why you think teams like Ohio State and, you know, Miami and those are the USC are chasing him so hard. Well, uh, the cool thing about Tackett is obviously he's, um, you know, he's the he's the nephew of the head coach at Manny, which is a, it's a powerhouse in that little neck of the woods in Louisiana. They make it to the state championship, if not every year, every other year. Um, it's just a community that's really high on football. It kind of reminds you of a Midwestern town, um, you know, that that just that mentality. And Tackett has been kind of an alpha of that program since he was a freshman. Um, he's kind of played this hybrid, you know, safety linebacker role that's, that's been adjusted and tweaked over the years. Um, and last year he played quarterback, you know, kind of that selfless kid that's going to do whatever for his team. But, um, you know, he's a safety by trade that's grown into this linebacker's body. Um, so you have all the, you know, the exciting trait to the safety that, you know, he's, he's instinctual in coverage. He can come down and, and pop you. Um, that also applies, you know, playing linebacker and the way they use him at Manny. Um, he's, you know, he's, you know, 10 yards off the ball. So he's basically playing middle linebacker, free safety, some hybrid of the two. Um, he, he flies to the football sideline, the sideline speed, the athleticism for the linebacker today to drop back at the coverage. And you talk about the schools that he's in the mix for with Ohio State being, you know, front and center, Wisconsin, Michigan. He, he fits the Big Ten mentality really well. Yeah, that's what uh, the first time I really spoke to Tack, it was last, I think, April. Uh, and he told me at the time, like, he felt like a player that was a Big Ten style of player. I've had it reiterated to me a few times since and talking to people around the program that he would prefer probably to play in the Big Ten. He just likes that style of defense. Also, do they spell Midwest Town differently down there? Is it T-A-U-X-N? Town? No, that's only for when you're going to the town. Um, so, so G-A-U-X-ing to the town. To the town. Correct. Okay, cool, 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 um, you you, know, You've been in this town, Berm. You don't act like you don't know. <laughs> never, never. I don't know anything about New Orleans. I've heard about it, but it seems like a wonderful place. I've had a, I've heard of hand grenades and, uh, you know, other things of that nature. Never they're, experienced them myself, but I imagine. They're, they're coming on strong these days. That's, they always do. Um, you know, Sam, as you look at a player like Tackett Curtis, why is the why are the traditional sec powers like lsu georgia alabama not involved um you know i think the biggest thing with lsu is uh the the coaching transition you know it's it's trying to find a fit and and this new lsu staff um has been more involved uh than the previous staff the the previous staff it just uh it, it wasn't working out with what those those coaches were looking for um you know louisiana is a unique uh, part of the country in which uh, LSU gets kind of its first crack to offer its kids. But when you offer a kid in Louisiana at LSU, you have to be willing to take their commitment. And, uh, you know, Tackett obviously got the offer, but there's there's two other, you know, three other safeties in this in this state that LSU, this new staff has kind of, you know, prioritized ahead of Tackett. Um, you know, linebacker, you know, I, I think they'd like to see him work out there, which, you know, remains to be seen. Um, if he wants to do that, because there's schools elsewhere in the country that don't want him to work out and will take him as, as take his commitment any day now. So um, it's really on what, what he really feels best. You know, he, he likes LSU. You know, he's from Manny, Louisiana, but um, he's, you know, he's been very open about it just because he grew up rooting for a team doesn't mean that, you know, it's the best fit for him in terms of his future. So, um, you know, the Alabamas, the LSUs have not been involved. You know, they've all kind of they've all been around Manny. They've all expressed interest. They've um, you know, I think what it came down to was, was the coaches that, that kind of vibe with Tackett and, uh, it just happened to be the Ohio state staff and then Jim Knowles in particular, um, before that, you know, Lincoln Riley, um, you know, Jim Harbaugh, just different, different coaches have vibe with him. And some of these SEC coaches just haven't. I know that recently you were in Texas, you saw Calvin Simpson hunt. It's a player. Andrew really likes it on this film, uh, is a big fan of his. I mean, this is a player, a Texas Tech commitment who sort of, it's been, what, three weeks ago and no one really was talking about him and now everyone is. What is it about a kid like that when, when these schools are making their, their way through Texas when they stop in and go, uh, wait a second, we need to take another look at 
I don't Waka Hachi. How is that pronounced? Waxahachie. 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 What the? It's a it's a strong X. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> I, would, um, I mean, what are these? Why are these schools all of a sudden just matriculating to Waxahachie? What are they watching? Well, Waxahachie. Who have that? You know, on, 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 honestly, it, you know, if you've been to DFW, uh, if you're recruiting that area, if you're recruiting Texas, you know, there's there's just so many schools that you can get to. Uh, Waxahachie has not always been this this powerhouse full of, you know, a ton of prospects, but but Calvin has been there um, and, and he, you know, he had a great junior season. So don't get me wrong. Um, but really, with with all the accolades on during track season, Waxahachie had a, a deep run in track and field and, and the more. Uh, schools got got word of the times, um, you know, get their, you know, the, the, they got finally got a chance to go see what he looked like in person. I think that um, from talking to people at the high school, I think some people thought that Calvin, because he's so fast, uh, might have been a little bit slighter than um, than maybe what coaches realize. He's he's a legitimate six foot. Um, he's 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 built very very thick. Um, he's he's going to be two hundred pounds here in the next you know couple of months, um, probably about before football season. Is a little over one ninety right now. Um, and, 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 you know, once, you know, once a certain school offers it, it's got a domino effect, you know, if, if you're in the SEC and, and, and A&M offers, you know, that Georgia and Alabama and LSU are going to follow suit and, and take a look at the kid. And if you're in big 10 country or big 12 country if Oklahoma or Texas offers, if Ohio state offers, um, there's always a domino effect. Um, so I think, yeah, some schools are a little bit late to the party, but you know, to, there hasn't really been a spring evaluation period like we've had this year in, in some time. So, uh, you have to give some credit to the coaches too. And it's not even like just some schools relate to the party. The media, even as as widespread as we are in, in this industry, like you can't see everyone all the time. So, you know, it, it's not always easy to find a kid like that. You broke the news on, on Wednesday night that he has his official visit scheduled to Ohio State for the weekend of, of uh, June 17th. What odds are there for Ohio State to really get into that recruitment based on what you've heard? I know Perry Eliano is the guy leading the way for the Buckeyes. Very good reputation in Texas as a guy that's from Texas originally, but what have you heard that would give Buckeyes fans reason to be optimistic? Yeah, I think um, as soon as Ohio State offered, um, they they kind of went about things to the to the liking of Calvin Simpson Hunt and, and his inner circle. Um, they're um, very focused on academics. Um, it might actually be a bigger priority to them than, than any other factor, um, which is why Stanford is probably the, the other, the, probably the biggest, you know, team, biggest threat to watch because of what they can offer academically. Um, Texas Tech is obviously in the mix, but Ohio State, not only is it going to hit on the academics, um, the history with defensive backs, which is, people, you know, other people in his circle that are, you know, more knowledgeable of football are obviously, you know, more making him more aware of that. And, um, Coach Eliano has done a good job of not only meshing with Calvin, who is going through things as mature as a 17 year old can do things. You know, he's not posting offers until he can have conversations with the coaches and the coaches can have the conversations with his mom and to see how quickly they set up this official visit. It kind of shows how quickly uh, the Ohio State coaches have meshed with Calvin and his mom, who is playing a big role in his recruitment. Um, this visit does loom really large. There's a lot of excitement toward it. Um, and he's going to follow this with going to Texas Tech. I think he's going to take at least two or three summer officials. Um, and he's been very calculated. LSU doesn't seem like it's going to get one. Florida will will be determined this week. Um, Alabama, obviously, he's going to see if he's going to go there unofficially and then determine if they're going to get an OB. Um, but he's, you know, he's not set on staying in state. He's got no qualms about leaving. Um, he's he's just taking everything in and seeing how it matches up in, in terms of academics and, and obviously the development there. NIL is not a, a massive factor. It's It's maybe part of the equation. Um, so let's see what Ohio State can check in that department. But um, I think they have a, a really decent shot. And, and depending on what the mood is after the visit, they could be in line for, you know, see how much further they can go in this race. Well, Andrew, how does that make you feel? Um, that makes me feel happy. That, that is good news. So another big visitor in June. Uh, he's one of a long list. So that is positive. You know, I think it's fascinating. And Sam, this will be the last thing I, I could I could talk to you about recruiting forever, especially when it involves Waxahachie. But, of course. Um, you know, I think that you look at a guy like Calvin Simpson Hunt, and to me, this is how recruiting should be. And I know that there's fans out there who will be very upset about, oh, this player's committed. What happened to the days of a commitment meaning something and all that, right? But this is a player who four months ago, not a lot of people knew about. And he had an opportunity, a big time offer from Texas Tech to, to lock in a spot, and he took it and made sure that he's got a spot in the class. And now he's 
responsibly looking at other schools that fit what he's looking for. This isn't a kid who's off for chasing. It's not a kid that's out there, uh, you know, clout chasing on social media. And I think that it's a real testament to, you know, the people around him that he's handling it the right way and, and doing it in a, in a mature way, because this process, as you, you've seen, especially, and I've seen it a lot, obviously, like it changes people if you let it. And it's pretty great that it hasn't, and you know, what else hasn't changed, Sam, you, you slippery. Son well, let me, let me just kind of piggyback off that. You know, if, if you followed any of our reporting on Calvin and, um, you know, since I've been to Waxahachie, I've been able to report on him pretty frequently. And, and it's been a, a, like you said, it's a crazy recruitment that's taken lots of twists and turns, but pretty ra- rapidly as new options, you know, emerge. He's really only been to LSU, Stanford and Texas Tech. And like you said, Joey McGuire came in, um, had a great relationship with the coaches at Waxahachie, threw an offer on the table based off his track times, based off his junior film, and he committed pretty quickly. At that point, Joey McGuire said, you're the number one corner on our board. You're going to you're going to blow up. People are going to see how talented you are once they get to you know go to your campus and see you work out. Um, and we want you to go explore. And if you like everything more than Texas Tech, go there. And if you like Texas Tech more, then, cut, then you have a spot here for us, you know, until signing day. Um, and he and if you follow our reporting, you know that Calvin is exploring his options. He's very high on Stanford. Um, he's going to Florida this weekend. He, he seems to be going to Alabama and he's going to officially visit Ohio State. He was previously going to officially visit Notre Dame and that got replaced with Ohio State, which you see, obviously, they're coming on pretty strong. Um, it's a calculated approach. It's a little bit old school, but you know what? He, he's still honoring his pledge. He's still visiting Texas Tech. Um, he's still communicating with Joey McGuire really frequently. That staff's doing a great job, um, but he's still exploring his options at the same time. There's nothing wrong with that. He's got to do the best thing for, for him. So we'll see what happens. Yes. Sam, I have a, a quick blast from the past recruiting question for you. So I recall March of 2019, I saw a tweet from you with a very young Jackson Smith and Jigba sporting an Ohio State polo back in the day. Um, we all we've all seen what he's what he can do and what we're expecting next season. How does he compare to any of the other big name? There's been a ton of them, Texas or your region receivers that you've seen over your uh, many years of service. Uh, there are two, there are three receivers that I've been very fortunate to cover that stand out um, way above the rest. And when I, and, you know, receivers um, now they're getting paid, you know, a ton, but there's also a ton of receivers that come out each year. And if you look at like the on 300, there's a, there's a ton of receivers in there. They go really deep. Jackson Smith and Jigba, Jamar Chase and Devonte Smith are the three best receivers I've ever seen in person. They have been proved unguardable. Um, Jamar and Jackson, um, they didn't have the, you know, the speed of the, you know, the four, three, of, you know, the Tyree kills, um, still unguardable Jackson's game against Allen in the playoffs. Um, the second round of playoffs in, in Jerry's world is one of the best single game performances I've ever seen. And the, the situation with being rock wall against Allen, um, it was absolutely out of this world. And for him to step up to that challenge in that setting, I think says a lot about Jackson and how moments don't get too big for him. And we've seen that. Uh, the last big game he played in that the moment just didn't get too big for him. And he's going to be called in the what in the first 10 or 12 picks in, you know, a little bit less than a year. And some team's going to have another, you know, future franchise building block at, at wide receiver like in Jackson. Sam was with rivals when Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, erupted onto the recruiting scene. And Sam was the first national recruiting guy to be pounding the table that he was not only a pretty darn good receiver, but a five-star can't miss player. So kudos, Samuel. Well, I, I call, we had ranking meeting rankings meetings the week of that round of playoffs. And then, you know, that happened on like a Thursday or a Friday night. And I remember calling from the parking lot the next morning at like 7 a.m. saying, no, 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 no. He needs to be above everyone. Um, he needs, you know, name a receiver. He was better. And I still feel pretty good about that. Yeah, it seemed like you did all right, Sam. We're glad to have you with On3.com. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate you. And, uh, you know, I would like to have you do this more often because I have uh, lacking insight in the part of the country you live in. Uh, Tell me more about this New Orleans sometimes. We can talk about it off the record. I'm sure that uh, there's probably rules about what you can say about New Orleans on a video. So uh, thanks for for joining us, Sam. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh, I'll, I'll be here anytime you need me. Adios. Thanks. We're back. Uh, really appreciate Sam Spiegelman from On3's uh, national recruiting team joining us. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. We don't get to hear 
other voices all that often, which we probably need to because my voice is super annoying. Andrew, we talked a lot about Calvin Simpson Hunt there, cornerback, and you know that's one position where Ohio State right now with one player committed to John Johnson, they need two or three more in this class. And, and you start to wonder – what the Buckeyes uh, are looking for at that spot, because for months we talked about AJ Harris. That one's off the off the board now. We have Kyan Lee still on the on top of the list. Christian Gray still there. He's going to take an official visit to Ohio State. I believe it's going to be that big June twenty fourth weekend. So you can start to start to put some uh, talking points together, like who who are they inviting when? Um, it brings me to Jermaine Matthews uh, from Winton Woods High School down in Cincinnati, who as a player I'm a big fan of. Very similar style physically, I think, to Calvin Simpson Hunt. And the Buckeyes have not offered. Jermaine Matthews had intended on camping on June 1st and tweeted on Tuesday night that he was not going to do any camps this summer. And personally, I think he should. I think it's a bad decision not to just because, I mean, any opportunity to compete is a good opportunity to compete. But it seems like this is a kid who's decided Ohio State's seen him enough times in person if they were going to offer, then they would. But, uh, man, I don't know. It, it is so risky when you when you look at really talented players. He's got like 30-some offers. And, uh, you know, this is a player that's going to play and start in a major college football program in the next couple of years. How bold is it to let a player like that leave the state? I wouldn't really say it's bold. I mean, I he's somebody that I would want in this class as a cornerback two or three, I would say. Um, I'm, I'm so, I'm just as surprised as you are that he made that tweet about not, not camping. And maybe that tweet means nothing and maybe he'll show up here in the next few weeks. Um, but I don't know if he will leave the state. If he doesn't end up at Ohio state, he might, he may very well end up with Luke fickle. Uh, do you remember the name of that tight end a couple of several years ago who was camp going to camp and camp was it Conrad? Is that, was that his name? Ended up at CJ, CJ Conrad. Yep. Yeah. I remember, I just remember that being one of those situations too, where Ohio state really wanted to see the guy and he. I think he camped multiple times, but um, I don't CJ know. Came to camp and CJ came to camp, and then the Buckeyes offered another tight end in the camp yep. uh, right. that they received a commitment from who then ended up decommitting and playing like D2 ball or something somewhere. CJ did get a shot in the NFL, had some issues, and is now a coach at Kentucky. So right. you just never know, right? Yeah, you really never know. But, but yeah, I mean, Matthews is one of about five or six guys that we've got on our list of some potential cornerback targets. Daniel Harris from Florida is another, another big one. Um, I mean, I feel pretty good about Ohio State landing two guys off that list. I would say Kyan Lee is probably the most likely at this point. Um, I would like to see Jermaine Matthews camp, though. So I'm right yeah. there with you. Bro. I would, too. And it's not even just him. His teammate, Cameron Calhoun, who's committed to West Virginia, I think, should come up and camp at Ohio State. There's opportunities there uh, to, to make a, a, a move. And I think that you brought up an interesting point that maybe not on purpose, but you did anyway. Um if let's say Jermaine Matthews ends up committing to Cincinnati and Ohio State decides four months from now that they want to go get him, it's a much harder go get than it used to be because Luke Fickle's done such a great job and because Kerry Combs is now at Cincinnati. So it's not quite the same, hey, let's just revisit this in four months and saunter in there and, and bring you back. I think these are decisions that are being made in May and June that are essentially saying, okay, this, this one's off the board. We gotta, if, if someone else doesn't come on, we're going to have to find something totally new. And I think that's where the risk is because it's not as easy as it used to be to go to Kentucky or Cincinnati and say, okay, Ohio guy, you're committed there. Now, now oh, join us uh, because we want you now. I don't think it's going to work that way anymore. No. And if he commits to Cincinnati, let's just hypothetically say sometime this summer, and then um, Ohio State misses on some of those other guys, Kyan Lee, Daniel Harris, those guys. And then in December, they try to push for Matthews. And then, you know, Luke Fickle and, and Kerry Combs can tell him, you know, we've, We've been prioritizing you for for months now, and they're trying to swoop in here at the last minute and get you. And that I just I don't know how likely that would be that Ohio State wins that battle late like that. Yeah, I don't think it would be likely at all. So I, I think that's part part of the risk that you run here. And Ohio State is still the big dog in Ohio, and, and still the big dog in the Midwest. But the the smaller dogs are getting bigger, and uh, there are a lot more you know dog parks to play in where people are where people's dogs are getting attention. You know what I mean? Like Cincinnati had nine dogs in the NFL draft just uh, a few weeks ago. So all of a sudden it becomes a lot harder to be like, hey, your dog is never going to play in the NFL if he goes to that dog park. Because guess what? That dog park is producing NFL draft pups, picks, draft picks, not pups. That's not the direction I was expecting you to go with that, but I like it. So, yeah, you're right. 
sometimes. Sometimes I just I'm chasing. <laughs> I'm just a guy. I'm just a dog chasing a car. Sometimes, Andrew, and this is one of those moments. Um, what else can we talk about? Is there anything else on pressing that you're like, hey, let's talk about that because these people who are watching this and listening to this deserve it. Honestly, not really. Pick, pick one topic and let's hammer it, and then we'll call it a night. Pick one topic and hammer it. Okay. Um, let's say Notre Dame. Ooh, Notre Dame like is that. Notre Dame has the number one class right now for for the class of 2023. I was doing yeah. some like calculations as far as if Ohio State adds it, Brandon Ennis, Carnell Tate, and a couple other guys. And even with some of those big additions, they were still going to be behind Notre Dame's where Notre Dame's class is at right now. Um, I guess I'm just thinking out loud. And now we saw Richard Young is going to be visiting officially Notre Dame, even though they were not in his top seven. And I guess I'm just thinking out loud here is how real is this Marcus Freeman surge that's going on right now? Keon Keeley's another guy Ohio State's trying to get. There's a bunch of names out there. It's real. It's Notre Dame. They should be a great recruiting program. And they have been for the last, you know, 25 years waiting to have a coach that had a little bit of swag to him. Uh, And, you know, what we're seeing and I, I think this is a testament to college football players all across the country, and especially to high school coaches across the country. There are a lot of kids now emerging that are, and I'm going to say this with, with air quotes, not because I don't mean it, but because I, I'm trying to make it encompass a broad spectrum. Notre Dame type kids. Uh, there, there's a lot more of them now than there were 10 years ago. I really feel that way. And, and you start to see a connection developing between the younger coaching staffs that Notre Dame's put together. They've done a great job. You've got a guy like, um, you know, Dylan McCullough now coaching the running backs who is coached in the NFL and not just coaching the NFL, but coached the Super Bowl champions in the NFL. Marcus Freeman's uh, impact as a younger guy who really can relate. Um, Tommy Reese as a younger guy. These are, you know, these are people that these kids have grown up watching and they know who they are. And I think it matters. I mean, I, I don't necessarily believe or buy into the fact that they're going to be the number one class in the country. But uh, Harry Highstead back at Notre Dame with the offensive line coaching, he's he's a one of the best offensive line coaches in the country and has been uh, at his previous stop at Notre Dame and was a guy that absolutely obliterated Ohio State on the recruiting trail multiple times when he was in South Bend before. Um, they, they've done a great job again at that position. Players like Monroe Freeling from South Carolina, who Ohio State's trying to get on campus, has a much better relationship with Notre Dame, despite the fact that they have tackles, uh, other tackles in the mix. Um, and the one area they've done a really great job is the defensive line recruiting right now. And some of that was because Mike Elston did the work before he left for Michigan. Uh, but Al Washington, to his credit, has went in there and, and not let anything slip. And uh, you, you know that he's going to take it a little bit personal. You, I'm sure Marcus Freeman, uh, maybe not quite personal, but, you know, it, he wants to beat Ohio State. Um, I, I think it's good for college football when, when programs like Notre Dame and Ohio State and Clemson are getting players that are great people and great talents uh, on the field and off the field. And um, I'm excited for the Midwest. I think, you know, we've talked about it for years privately and talked about it with Spencer and other people on this show, like the Midwest for a while was really in a struggle, but right now with Ohio state at the top of the sport, Michigan coming back, Notre Dame coming back, Michigan state coming back, Penn state coming back, Cincinnati, Kentucky, like it's becoming a a much better region for football. And I think a rising tide lifts all boats. So I'm, I'm for it. I mean, I I think it, you want those competitions. It, It shouldn't be a situation where Ohio state can take whoever they want, whenever they want all the time. Yeah, the, the the number of storylines on that September 3rd uh, primetime game is going to be just through the roof on the recruiting side and just old faces and familiar places. Just so much. Yeah, so much I can. That one should be a fun one. And I want to talk about Keon Keeley if we can, because I did include him in my class prediction. Uh, that is entirely a gut feeling based on just a few conversations I've had with Keon over the last year. Uh, I think that it's going to be a hard sell that that prediction is generally speaking meant to be best case scenario uh, for Ohio state. I could easily pick three or four other guys to, that would be like, Oh, this is more realistic at the moment, but I, I, Ohio state's not thinking let's find the most okay player on, on May 18th, right there. Well, let's get the best player we can get who fits the program the best. And that's Keon Keeley. If he makes an official visit to Ohio state this summer, just watch out. I mean, I guess that's what it comes down to if it, if it happens. What I think will happen is that even if that visit occurs, it's not like it's going to be publicized or something crazy is going to be swirling around it. So 
I just think he's one of those guys that fits Ohio State really well. I know he's close with Luke Montgomery and a few of the other guys in the Buckeyes class, and I just don't think Ohio State's going to walk away from that one that easy. Notre Dame obviously isn't going to let him go without a fight, but um, the Buckeyes have Larry Johnson on their side, and generally speaking, that uh, turns out well. Um, and Tony Alford is the primary recruiter there, uh, which also generally turns out well, especially down in Florida. So that's why I have Keon Keeley in that class. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the summer. But those predictions, I'm going to try to do one of those every two months or so, are going to change. They're going to fluctuate on defense, especially. Probably not on offense. There's not a lot left. Our guys have a pretty good idea of what they want to do on the recruiting trail on offense. Uh, wide receiver Brandon Ennis and Carnell Tate and Noah Rogers, I think, is is the goal. Uh, tight end, I think that they could probably still take another one. Jackson McGowan, Cincinnati tight end commit, is camping on June 1st, so that's one to watch. And then it's just pray for tackles, right? Pray for tackles. Yep, pray for tackles. The yearly, yeah. uh, the yearly prayer. That's it. Andrew Ellis, Jeremy Birmingham. This has been Talking Stuff presented by Byers Auto. Thanks for watching us on LettermanRoad.com. Head over to chat about this and more in the Letterman Lounge, our message forum on, on the on 3 Sports Network. So thanks for watching. Catch you next time. See you.